Okay, so rolling motion. Now, if you haven't watched the video previous to this one in the series where I, we do a little bit of an example problem of me bicycling along and figuring out how far I go, given uh, some information about the angular velocity and displacement and things like that of my bicycle, you probably should go back and, and get a little context from that. But the type of motion that we were exhibiting there, we were assuming there, is that when I hit the brakes to avoid running into the back of that truck, I did not skid. I continued to roll, and specifically I continued to roll without slipping. Okay? Because the assumption that we made is that the arc length, right, so sort of the linear displacement along the tire as I went around and around and around that number of meters, was exactly equal to the distance I actually covered in a line, okay? And that does not need to be true, right? If I started skidding, that I, I hit my brakes too hard and the wheel locks, so it has zero angular velocity, and thus it's covering zero arc length, I would still be moving forward, at least for a little bit of time, and so delta x would not equal the arc length along the wheel. Okay, so this is a special condition, though one that we generally like to be in when we're on a, <laughs> on a bicycle or in a car or something like that, where we are rolling without slipping. What does this mean? Okay, well, visually, if you just take my front tire there and you imagine putting a couple of dots on it, so I got a purple dot up here and I've got a green dot down here, and you look at uh, the wheel going through one half of a revolution, okay? Well, that means that the purple dot, so if we're moving, if we're rotating this direction, if the purple dot goes through a half a rev, it's going to move down to the bottom of the wheel. And the green dot, if you imagine just like a little splotch of paint on the tire, will move up to the top, right? One half rev, they f go around 180 degrees, and so they flip flop, okay? Now, <clears throat> What that means is that if I'm rolling without slipping, well, if there is any slip, then the velocity of that point relative to the ground is going to be non-zero, right? If this thing is not rolling and you're just skidding along, then the whole wheel would be moving relative to that ground. And you want to maintain grip, generally speaking, when you're on a bicycle or in a car. And so when you're doing that, there's enough status, static friction between the tire and the surface to make that point instantaneously have zero velocity and then it rolls and the very next point has zero velocity relative to the ground etc etc okay that's rolling without slipping and when that happens if you imagine well, let's see like if if you coated the tire in green paint so like this whole this whole little bit of green here is like actual wet green paint and you went through a half a rev well then you'd leave a line painted line on the ground that in green paint i suppose i should actually have green here <laughs> in green paint that was exactly the same length as this arc length that we go through along the wheel so if you go through a half a rev you have a pi radians and you multiply that by the radius of the circle, and that gives you the arc length along the wheel that you cover. And if we're rolling without slipping, what we're saying is that this delta x, so the actual forward pros progress from here to there of the wheel, is going to be exactly equal to that same number of meters. This is the condition for rotational motion. It's usually stated a couple of different ways. So let's look at those. But what we're saying here is, ah, well, for rolling without slipping, delta x equals delta s. If you started to slip, well, then you could still have delta x, but it wouldn't necessarily equal delta s. If you actually locked up the tire, delta s would be zero. And this would be, this would still be some value because you'd be skidding forward, right? But for rolling without slipping, those two things are going to be exactly the same. That allows us to in turn say, okay, well, how, how, do, we, how do we get this, how do we get this relationship? Where'd that come from? Well, we divide both sides by delta t. What does that give you? Well, this gives, gives you velocity of the object, 
as it moves forward. And on the other side, this is our expression for the tangential velocity of the wheel at that point, right? This would be some vt, v sub t. Mm -hmm. And that's where this relationship over here comes from. Okay? In addition, we know that the tangential velocity of the wheel is related to omega r. Okay? Now, this is always true, right? You can have a wheel that uh, is on ice, and you're pedaling and pedaling and pedaling and pedaling, and you're spinning the wheel and spinning the wheel and spinning the wheel, but if you have no traction, then this, right, the v of the object would actually be zero, right? Even though you would have tangential velocity because you have angular velocity, you just wouldn't have any grip. So you could not grip the ground and actually roll without slipping as we're seeing here, okay? This is usually, this is the oft quoted condition for rolling without slipping, though uh, this one, right, delta x equal delta s is, is also sufficient. And if this is true and this is true, well then also the acceleration of me and the bicycle and the wheels has to be equal to the tangential acceleration of the points on the edge of the wheel. And that in turn is equal to alpha r. So that's also a condition for rolling without slipping. And depending on the problem that you happen to be solving, uh, one or the other of those conditions is useful, okay? And that's generally where we're gonna be in this class. We're not gonna consider too many cases where we are rolling with slipping because things get considerably more complicated. But it's important to recognize that that's not always the case and when it is, and when it isn't. And these are the conditions under which you will have rolling without slipping. Or if you're told rolling without slipping, you can rely on these qualities to be true. All right, so that's it for our little unit on rolling motion. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Actually, there's one more like slightly mind-bending thing that I'd like to show you about rolling motion, okay? Think about what I said initially. I told you that the static friction was enough that that point in contact with the road does not slip, right? The whole without slipping part. And yet I'm telling you that if you have rolling without slipping, then you have some forward progress, right? The sort of center of mass of this object is moving forward with some velocity v. Cool. But doesn't that mean if this part is moving at zero velocity, and this part, the center of it, is moving with velocity v, well then to have everything average out to be just this value, right? Because the whole object has to move forward at that value, but part of it is stopped, right? The part down here in contact with the ground. That means, weirdly, okay, that the very top of the wheel actually has to be moving twice as fast as the center of mass, the center of the wheel. Weird, assuming that mass is evenly distributed, okay, without, throughout the wheel. Weird, okay? That's so that you average out the parts down below that are moving slowly, or are, like that point that's in contact with the ground, actually moving at zero velocity for an instant before it comes up and away from the ground and the next part actually comes into contact. This is why that, and I don't know how well this will translate, the picture's a little bit small. This is why, though, if you take a photograph of a rolling wheel, and there's some depth perception issues going on here with the plane of focus because, of course, the spokes aren't all on the same plane if you've ever looked at a bicycle wheel, right? They, they sort of slope a little bit themselves. But you'll notice that up here, you can tell that there are supposed to be spokes there, but there's virtually nothing that you can actually see in the photograph of this rolling wheel. And yet down here, you can actually pick out each individual spoke without too much difficulty. There, there's a little blurring, again, because of the... the lack of focus on the, on the spokes because of, you know, they're not all in one plane, okay? But you can actually resolve them, and that's because of this thing, this, this weirdness where the point in contact with the road is at zero velocity, which means that the, the instantaneous velocity of any point up along the wheel, it's moving very, very fast up at the top compared to what it's doing down here. And because it's moving more slowly, when you, you know, expose the film to take this picture, 
you can actually resolve the spokes. Whereas up here at the top, well, all those linear velocities are quite a bit higher, and so everything blurs out, and you can't resolve uh, an image of the spokes. Pretty wild, huh? Think about that. There's some diagrams in your book that might help, and maybe I'll put a link uh, to an external resource on the Brightspace page. But anyway, that is the actual end of our discussion of rolling motion, and I will see you later for more physics.